Let's start this review with a question. Why are you listening to this mini-lecture? Are you deeply interested in the process of instructional design? Or perhaps you're going through this lecture because you need to take this course and achieve a certain grade. Maybe you're looking to refresh your memory or your skills in the area of instruction. Or perhaps you're looking at this for a whole different reason, such as how does one prepare a lecture or what are the graphical design aspects of this lecture or video? Or perhaps you stumbled upon this video because of a Google search, so you're curious to see what it is about. Your reason for listening might be one of those things, or even a combination of many of those things. In any event, you are motivated in some way to watch this lecture. Let's see if we can better understand the aspect of motivation when it comes to the design of instruction. If you've gone through the prior lectures, you've been following the systematic approach to instructional design. You've been following the ADDI path of design, and you've been through the analysis phase of the model, and recently completed the design phase of the model. You're now moving into the development phase of the model, where you're going to actually start developing and selecting your instructional materials. During this phase, we begin to think of the instructor of the material that you'll be developing as the motivator, the presenter, the leader, and the evaluator of the instruction. As instructional designer, you're going to want to develop materials, strategies, and resources for the instructor to be successful. Before you do that, however, experts such as Dick and Carey suggest that you look to develop instructional materials that will allow the student to learn the information and skills without instructor or other intervention. And once you've completed that task, you can move that content to an instructor-led package. Whether it's self-paced or instructor-led, you're going to need to have the learner attend to your material. There's got to be some motivation on the part of the learner just to engage with your instruction. And during the development phase, you're going to consider that learner motivation so that you can develop the best material. For our purposes of instructional design, let's think of learner motivation as this. Having some good reason to do something or wanting to do it. Your learner is going to have some reason for working with your instruction, and it can be different for each learner. If you can better understand learner's motivation, you'll develop better instruction. Can you think of instruction that you didn't care for or criticisms of instruction? Perhaps you found the instruction boring or not of interest or not applicable to what you were looking to learn. Often the instruction is criticized because it fails to attend to the learner or gain or keep the learner's attention or it fails to help the learner advance their skills or knowledge. Tending to motivation is critical to successful development of instruction. When it comes to a system of principles for instructional design that can be used to help the motivational qualities, we can look to John Keller's ARCS model for influencing learners. Keller developed this model in the mid-1980s, and it focuses on four major areas, attention, relevance, confidence, and satisfaction. In 1983, Keller suggested that as instructional designers, we'll want to produce instruction that is interesting, meaningful, and appropriately challenging. Keller suggests that this can be done in a systematic way, and he developed what's come to be known as ARC's model. As a model to be used for influencing learners, ARC's looks to four major areas, attention, relevance, confidence, and satisfaction. We'll want to consider ARC's model as we develop our instruction. How have researchers approached this area of motivation when it comes to instructional design? There's been a shift in the study emphasis on approaches to motivation over the recent years. This shift has come in the area of looking more towards cognitive-centered approaches to motivation rather than through a process of reinforcement. 
These two approaches are based in their orientation, with reinforcement generally considered an extrinsic approach that emphasizes reward and punishment. Intrinsic approaches that are based in cognitive-centered theory look more at conditions within the learner that will have an effect on motivation. Smith and Reagan suggest that work in the area of intrinsic motivation generally focuses in five areas. Concern, competence, curiosity, autonomy, volition, and goal orientation. Each of these areas has a different slant to them. Competence leans toward the challenge of a task of the learner, while curiosity is triggered by surprise, the complexity, and the incongruity of instruction. With autonomy, self-determination and causality are of primary concern, and with volition, the learner leads to an internal valuing or self-regulating process. Finally, goal orientation tends to focus on what performance and learning goals the learner has in mind. Researchers have looked at motivation and have looked at levels of skill of the learner and challenges that are presented to them. From a learner's perspective, they will have a perceived challenge and a feeling of skill that they possess when presented with a task. Studies in this area have led to four defined motivational states. Apathy, boredom, anxiety, and flow. In looking at intrinsic motivation, the instructional designer needs to consider these states when developing instruction. When flow is achieved, it is more likely that the effort on the part of the learner will be more satisfying. Goal orientation can certainly lead to making an effort which is more satisfying for the learner. When goal orientation is present, it is usually in one of two forms, either a performance goal or a learning goal. Research seems to indicate that it is usually when learning goals are present that there is a higher level of motivation and ultimately a higher level of engagement and achievement. When we think about motivation, we also have to take into account interest. Researchers have studied interest from the perspective of two different concepts, individual interest and situational interest. With individual interest, we note that it is usually around an enduring preference on the part of the learner for certain topics. Situational interest, on the other hand, usually comes in the form of an emotional state which is brought about in a situation. Reading and drawing interest seem to depend upon situational interest, whereas interest in arithmetic seems to be more dependent on individual interest. When it comes to a system of principles for instructional design that can be used to help the motivational qualities, we can look to John Keller's ARCS model for influencing learners. Keller developed this model in the mid-1980s, and it focuses on four major areas, attention, relevance, confidence, and satisfaction. Keller suggested that for learning to take place, the learner must attend to the material. Strategies to getting attention on the part of the learner include incongruity and conflict, concreteness, variability, humor, inquiry, and participation. Relevance of the instruction is attended to assist students in attaching value to the learning task and deepen the internalization of that value. Keller identified six relevance strategies that can be used to enhance motivation. Relevance strategies are intended to assist learners in attaching value to the learning task and deepen the internalization of that value. These strategies are experience, present worth, future usefulness, need matching, modeling, and choice. Confidence in the instructional strategies around it tend to focus on the various aspects of learner performance in the learning process. Keller recognized five different strategies to consider when you are looking at confidence. One is learning requirements. 
Learning requirements look to ensure that students clearly know what is being taught. Second, difficulty strategies can focus on sequencing the learning material and increasing difficulty. A third approach, expectation strategies, are suggestions for helping students acquire realistic and positive outlooks when working with the instructional material. Keller's fourth satisfaction strategy, attribution, involve helping students to attribute their successes to their work. And the fifth of Keller's satisfaction strategy, self-confidence, include sample techniques to help students build. Satisfaction strategies, according to Keller, look at affecting motivation through managing the consequences of the student activities. These strategies include natural consequences, unexpected rewards, positive outcomes, avoidance of negative influences, and scheduling. An example of natural consequences may be a strategy which allows the learner to use skills as soon as possible after the instruction. Unexpected reward strategies may be something such as inserting non-contingent or unexpected material or resources into the instruction. Satisfaction based on positive outcomes may be something like providing the learner with verbal praise immediately after a learning task. An approach using avoidance of negative influence strategies may be as simple as ensuring that students are not subject to threats or surveillance methods of instruction. And scheduling strategies may be an approach whereby there is scheduled reinforcement when learning new tasks. In 1905, Edward Thorndike published The Law of Effect Principle. The principle suggests that responses closely followed by satisfaction will become firmly attached to the situation and more likely to reoccur when the situation is repeated. If the situation is followed by discomfort, on the other hand, the connection to the situation will become weaker and the behavior of responses is less likely to occur upon repeat of a situation. Smith and Reagan suggested that Keller's satisfaction strategies essentially operationalized Thorndike's law of effect. If a stimulus is followed by a response that is followed by a satisfier, then the stimulus-response connection will be strengthened. As part of Keller's ARCS model, he developed a process model for assisting instructional designers in incorporating motivational strategies into the instruction. According to Keller, the instructional design should first determine and define motivational issues. Second, design the targeted motivation. Third, the designer should select motivational strategies to use. Fourth, develop the motivational elements. And fifth, evaluate everything. This process sounds a bit like the ADDIE model of instructional design, doesn't it? Take a moment to consider the learner and why motivation is critical if learning is going to occur during an instructional process. Might the work of Keller and others help us as instructional designers consider ways to approach motivation as we develop instruction? We are, after all, looking closely at the principles of instructional design, and motivation plays such an important role to help to ensure that our ultimate goal with instruction takes place. That is, Will this instruction provide for learning to occur?